First Peter. Continuing on in First Peter. And we've been looking for the last several weeks on the blessings of salvation. <clears throat> we began in verse 3 in this section where he says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. And so we began to praise God for salvation. And if we remember the context of 1 Peter, that there was much suffering that was going on. And there was specific suffering, I believe, that was going to come in the lives of these people in this region. But there was also general suffering about which Peter was informing them and encouraging them in. And this type of suffering we all go through today, and we cover that a little bit this morning as we come down to verse 6. But I'd like if we could to read from verse 3 right down through verse 7 together. 1 Peter chapter 1, beginning in verse 3 and concluding with the end of verse 7. Let's begin with verse 3. Blessed be the God. Here we go. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ which according to his abundant mercy hath begotten us again unto a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance incorruptible, undefiled, and that fadeth not away, reserved in heaven for you who are kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time, wherein ye greatly rejoice, Though now for a season, if need be, ye are in heaviness through manifold temptations, that the trial of your faith, being much more precious than of gold that perisheth, though it be tried with fire, might be found unto praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Father, do thank you for your word. And thank you for allow allowing us to look into it this morning. I thank you for providing these truths for us in your word so that we may understand better how you're dealing with us in our lives and why we go through the things that we do and what our perspective ought to be in the middle of them. We thank you, Lord. We ask your spirit to use your word in our hearts. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, as we come to this, uh, under the blessings of God and salvation, we want to see some perspectives that, uh, that arise from our salvation, perspectives of life, perspectives that ar arrive at us from our salvation. The first one is in verses 6 and 7. The second one is in verses 8 and 9. The first one in verses 6 and 7 is our perspective of our trials. The second is in verses 8 and 9, which we won't get to this morning, and that is our perspective of Jesus Christ, because in verse 8 he says, whom having not seen ye love, and he's referring back to the last two words of verse 7, which is Jesus, which are Jesus Christ, the name of Jesus Christ. And so he begins in verses 8 and 9 to remind us of him and what he's done for us in our lives. But in verses 6 and 7, the Lord tells us how our salvation should affect and change our perspective of our trials and our suffering that we go through in our lives, because we all do go through suffering. So we have to learn how to reconcile those things, because when we look at it, we are be tempted to question God. God, why are you, should you be allowing this in my life? Why are you doing this in my life and not doing this in somebody else's life? Do I deserve this? Do I need to learn this? Or does that person need to learn it more? Why are you doing this to me? Why are you allowing this in my life? And we begin to sometimes, as Job was tempted to do, stand in judgment of God, when really the Lord is using these things for specific purposes in our lives. And so that's what the Lord wants us to see this morning, I believe from this passage, is our perspective in our trials. And our perspective in our trials as God's people, excuse me, I'm sorry here. I just want to make sure I'm prepared. And you'll have to forgive any... Uh, sputtering and coughing and sneezing that may come out of me because I'm dealing with some residual. So I'm sorry about that, but uh, we're going to continue on. Uh, so what is God's desire for us to have regarding our perspective of our trials, our perspective of the trials that we go through in our lives? He says there in verse 6, wherein ye greatly, greatly rejoice, though now for a season, if need be, ye are in heaviness through manifold temptations. Many times we are in heaviness. Uh, many days we just feel like things are heavy. I was speaking to a brother this morning. He just said, things are difficult. Things are heavy. And it's not easy. When I spoke with Ginny, I could see it in her face. It's heavy. It's not an easy thing. The vet on Wednesday night was giving us a prayer request. Things are heavy in her life. Uh, these things that come across us from the Lord that he allows into our lives are heavy. They're not easy. They're heavy. It's not like you just uh, carry a little bit. It's a burden. 
that we carry in our lives. He says, if need be, ye are in heaviness. And then he says this through manifold temptations. Manifold has the idea of something, there just being many of them and diverse. From all different sides, sometimes these calamities hit us. Sometimes it's not just one thing. Sometimes it's 15 things. Uh, an ache or a pain, an illness, plus dealing with something at work, plus dealing with something in the family, plus dealing with some other thing. Uh, it, uh, all of these things uh, can sometimes happen to us at one time. And you know that old saying, uh, when it rains, it pours, right? I like that. And, the, and it just seems like it happens. When, when I see somebody going through a trial, there's probably going to be another one coupled with it. Uh, sometimes the Lord works that way. We're in heaviness through manifold temptations. A lot of things at once sometimes come and hit us. That word manifold has the idea of being many colored, uh, like Joseph's coat of many colors, if you will. Uh, and it's just diverse, but it's all woven together, all at one time. Manifold temptations. The idea of temptations there is not just that Satan has come to try to tempt us with evil, though it can be that, but it has the idea, it's a broad-ranging idea of just difficulties that come into our lives, sufferings, trials, temptations, things that come in our lives to try us. They are temptations. They are sufferings. They are tribulations. They are troubles. They are trials. These things come into our lives, and they are there for a purpose, God says. And by the way, we have manifold temptations, but look at over in chapter 4, 1 Peter chapter 4, First Peter chapter 4, in verse 12, he also talks about the fiery trial, as he refers back to chapter 1. But in verse 10, he says, As every man hath received the gift, even so minister the same one to another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. Same word. And Peter here, in, in the context, is telling us that we have not only all of these different trials, manifold, many-colored trials, but we have a correlating many-colored grace of God to deal with those things. Doesn't that sound like Paul? My grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Yeah. And so Peter and Paul, there's no daylight between their doctrine regarding suffering. Uh, and Peter tells us we have the manifold grace of God. We have the manifold grace of God for manifold temptations. So when we get all of these things come into our lives from different angles, let's turn around and look at the grace of God and realize all the angles of the grace of God and how he's dealing with us in our lives. Anyway, back to chapter 1. He says, Wherein ye greatly rejoice, though now for a season, if need be, ye are in heaviness through manifold temptations. Wherein ye greatly rejoice. In what? Wherein? In what? In what can we rejoice? What is he referring to specifically? And the answer to that is all that is found in verses 3, 4, and 5. All that is found in verses 3, 4, and 5, specifically our salvation in Jesus Christ, if I were to sum it up. We rejoice in our salvation. We don't rejoice in the trial necessarily, glad that we're going to endure this suffering and this suffering and this suffering necessarily, and from this aspect of how we're to deal with our, tri our trials. What Peter is saying is that we have the opportunity to rejoice in our salvation and because we rejoice in our salvation and all these different aspects of our salvation, our hope, our inheritance, our holding in the Lord, because we have those things, then I can rejoice in my trial. Because now I know that my trial is not the end of things. I know that my trial has purpose. I know that my trial is less than what I have in Christ. So I rejoice in those things wherein ye greatly rejoice our salvation that's ready to be revealed in the last time. I greatly rejoice in that, though now for a season, if, ye need, if need be, ye are in heaviness. So the first point here is, I am, why can I rejoice in my trial, during my trial? Why I am rejoicing in the heaviness of trials? And that's the point that Peter gets across in verses 6 and 7. Why I am rejoicing in the midst of the heaviness of trials? Why I am rejoicing? Why can I rejoice? Why could Paul, Paul and Silas in the jail at Philippi sing praises unto God at midnight? Why could they? Why can we rejoice though we're in heaviness and going through manifold temptations? Number one, because I'm remembering their temporality. Number one, because I'm remembering their temporality. Wherein ye greatly rejoice, 
Though now for a season, Brother Steve, for a season, if need be, ye are in heaviness. Though now for a season, I am remembering their temporality. As I am going through the trial, I must remember its temporality. It's not forever. It's not going to last forever. Because of my great salvation, my inheritance, my hope, and my holding, I can be glad of these things. First, that my temptations are temporary. Notice what Peter says, though now for a season. For the Christian soul, all trials are temporary. All trials are temporary. Contrast this with our inheritance back in verse 4. Our inheritance in the Lord is incorruptible. It's undefiled and it fadeth not away. It's not temporary. It's permanent. But our trials, our temptations are temporary. Even our trials fade away. They fade away on this earth. Time heals all wounds. We know that statement. And that's true to some degree. That after so much time, the pain from a singular injury can begin to fade. But many of our tribulations on this earth are not punctiliar, but continuing. Or the results of them continue. And we know the truism, this too shall pass away. Have you heard that? This too shall pass away. And that again is somewhat true. All the things which we see and experience are temporary, so they will pass away. Psalm 144 verse 4 tells us, Man is like unto vanity, his days are as a shadow that passeth away. This world will pass away, so James 1 tells us, and this very chapter tells us, toward the end of the chapter, uh, verse 24, All flesh is as grass, the glory of man is the flower of grass, the grass withereth, the flower thereof falleth away, but the word of the Lord endureth forever. This world will pass away. But these... Speaking of passing away as mankind on the earth, not of his eternal state and not of his hurts and his troubles and his feelings, his memories, his heartaches. So while it's true that remembrances and feelings of many sorrowful things happening in our life may be suppressed, not all are so. So this too shall pass is not always true. It's not always so. And sometimes we might rather it not be so. Sometimes pain's gone and always, people gone are memories that shouldn't be gone. We want them to remain with us. We don't want to forget our loved ones. We don't want to forget things that have been taught to us. But these things bring with them their own renewed sorrows. When we remember the loss, that hurts us again. And it's something that we have to deal with all over and over again. But this is why we can truly rejoice in the season of trials. Because these trials which we face, if you're a Christian, are completely temporal. They're still temporal, but only if you're a Christian. Only if you've trusted in Jesus Christ. As believers, we don't look for time to heal our wounds, but for the Savior. For our great physician of the body, yes, but chiefly of the soul. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits, who forgiveth all thine iniquities, who healeth all thy diseases, who redeemeth thy life from destruction, and crowneth thee with loving kindness and tender mercies. That's Psalm 103, 1 through 4. The book of Revelation tells us that God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. Have you shed tears? God will wipe away all tears from your eyes. Past, present, and until he comes, future tears that will shed. God will wipe away all tears from our eyes. And he repeats it twice in the book of Revelation for emphasis. Not just once, but twice. The second time in chapter 21, verse 4, he tells us, And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes, and there shall be no more death, neither sorrow, nor crying, neither shall there any, be any more pain. So death, the ultimate cause for sorrow, sorrow, things that cause us grief in our lives, and even pain, which can cause us tears, those things will be gone. Anything that could be construed as negative will be gone. It will not exist. It will not be. We won't have the same recognition of them that we have now because it, it won't exist. Imagine it. These terrible things, sorrow, sadness, pain, and death, will be non-existent in the New Jerusalem. They won't be. It's not that so much time has passed that we've forgotten our pain, but that our pain will not exist. Only joy in the Lord will exist. Therefore, because our trials are temporary and because our sorrow will be gone, we can begin now in rejoicing. 
and we have a down payment. We have the Spirit of God. We can begin now in rejoicing. You know, I, I see, especially at Christmas time, these Christian buzzwords, you know, printed out just by themselves, one word, and you'll hang them on signs or whatever. And, uh, and the sad thing is that most people have no idea what they mean. Words like believe. Believe what? Or hope. Or joy. Or peace. Or rejoice. And they're just out there because the culture has adopted them from Christianity and from the scriptures because they mean something, because they're valuable to us. They even sound nice, don't they? But for us, they're real. They're not just this vague idea of some kind of wish for good, good things to happen around the Christmas season. It's because of what Christ has done, we have hope, real hope. Not just a wishful thinking, but a concrete expectation. We have something that is cause for rejoicing. Not because we're just happier because circumstances are good, but because we know that at the end of these things, we won't have any sorrow. And all the things that cause us grief today won't even exist in eternity. They won't be. We won't have those griefs. I believe in the factual and witness coming of the Lord from heaven in the person of Jesus Christ that he died on the cross to pay my sin debt and that he rose from the dead the third day and that he ascended back into heaven. I have a blessed hope, a lively hope, a joyous expectation, not a wish that he's coming again. I know that the beginnings of, my heavenly, of what my heavenly inheritance consists and I know that I am being kept by the power of God unto salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. You know that word rejoice? It's not just rejoice. Notice what he says wherein ye greatly rejoice. Because the word there means to be overjoyed. Overjoyed. So translated, greatly rejoice. So we're not just uh, happy about something. We're exultant because of what God has done for us. We have every reason to, opposite the heaviness of our trials and the grief and the burdensome of our trials, we have the opposite true in our lives also, that we can be greatly rejoicing in the Lord. Trials are heavy, there's no doubt about it. Now, I'm not saying you don't feel the grief. We don't feel the grief of our sorrow. Sure we do. But we should filter the grief of our sorrow as we process it in our lives through the great rejoicing that we have in the Lord Jesus. If we don't, we're going to be depressed. If we don't, we're going to be strapped down. We're going to be burdened down. We have to be able to filter those things in a biblical manner, in a factual manner, spiritually, concerning what the Lord has for us in the future. This, was, this is what everybody expects at Christmas time. They want joy. They, they, they want joy to be had at Christmas time. But it's true that the holiday season is a season of spiked anxiety, depression, and even suicide. Why? Because people don't get what they're looking for. The hope is deferred, and it makes the heart sick, as Proverbs tells us. Hope deferred maketh the heart sick. And so we have a lot of heart sick people out in the world right now, especially at this time because they don't have a proper understanding of what God is doing in our lives. They've not yet trusted in Jesus Christ, then they surely don't. And many Christians get wrapped up in this earthly mindset. So we look for everything to work out right at Christmas time, and when it doesn't, it's depressing. And it's like the ca carrot sometimes that is always dangled in front of people, whether it's Christmas or some other thing. It's gonna get better here. It's gonna get better here. It'll get better now. Well, maybe it won't on earth. And if you're lost, if you've not yet trusted in Jesus Christ, then it never will get better. But if you have trusted in Jesus Christ, then stop looking for that carrot and look to the end. Because there's a lot thing better than a carrot waiting for us. It's our inheritance, our heavenly inheritance. If you're not born again, this will be you at Christmas and in life, always hoping for something better, but never finding it. And without the concrete hope, concrete hope of the Christian, and you'll find yourself with a sick heart. But when you're newborn, newborn by the Spirit of God, you're placed into a different strata, one that provides an eternal reward, not a temporal. The Christian's desire, by the way, will most certainly come. That proverb goes on to say, but when the desire cometh, it is a tree of life. When the desire cometh, it is a tree of life. For the Christian, the desire will come. It will arrive to us, and it will certainly be the tree of life. 
the return of our Lord Jesus Christ will not be long deferred. It will not be long deferred. He is coming again. Hebrews 10, 37, for yet a little while, and he that shall come will come and will not tarry. Yet a little while. Remember that our trials are temporal. In a little while, the Lord is coming back or we go home to be with him. In a little while. And then we have all eternity to not have any sorrow or tears or crying. The former things will be passed away. But for a moment, is what Paul told the Corinthians regarding the sorrows that we have here. But for a moment. They are temporal. They are seasonal. I can rejoice in the heaviness of my trials because I know they are temporal. We can rejoice during tribulation because truly for the Christian, the best is yet to be. The best is yet to be. It is not here. It is yet to be. But we can rejoice now because of what we have then. All right, they're temporal, but also we can rejoice now because we realize their necessity. I am rejoicing in the heaviness of my trials because I am realizing their necessity. Their necessity. Peter here includes a little phrase, though now for a season, if need be, ye are in heaviness through manifold temptations. Manifold temptations, if need be. If need be. This thought of going through the suffering is softened, both from Peter's perspective and from the Lord's. So he puts it in this conditional form, if need be. Peter didn't want to see his former church members or those additional church members who now populated these churches in this greater region to which he wrote to have to undergo suffering. He didn't want to see that in their lives. And let me say, as your pastor, I don't want you to undergo suffering. It hurts me when you undergo suffering. I grieve for you. And you know what? Each one of us grieves for each other when we undergo suffering. I was just sick last week, not a great trial. Actually, it was a great trial for me. <laughs> Don't tell my wife. Uh, you know, she, she thinks that, you know, when I'm sick, I'm, I'm making it up, you know, all this. The man flu, they call it, you know. Uh, uh, she's a nurse, and, you know, she, I've seen her take care of so many people, and she's so merciful to people. And then when I get sick, she's like, get over it, you know. Uh, you're fine. <clears throat> yeah. It's hard. No, she takes good care of me. I'm just teasing. But uh, uh, th this, is the, th th this is the thing. We don't want each other to go through suffering. And we're all this way for each other. And many people texted me and uh, sent me an email or a note. And some even brought me gifts and dropped it at the front door because I was sick. Just a simple thing. But you showed your care for me because we're members of the same body. And because we have the same love one for another. And so as 1 Corinthians 11 tells us, when one, or excuse me, 12 tells us, when one member suffers, all the members suffer with it. If we're a healthy body, if we have true Christ-like love for one another, if we have true unity in the spirit, we all suffer together as one suffers. <clears throat> the Lord has compassion on us also in our testings. The Lord is very pitiful and of tender mercy, James 5.11 tells us. Hebrews 4.15, for we have not an high priest who cannot be touched with the feelings of our infirmities but was all, in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. Was it not the Lord Jesus himself, who in the days of his flesh, when he had offered up prayers and supplications with strong crying and tears unto him that was able to save him from death, and was heard in that he feared, though he were a son, yet learned he obedience by the things which he suffered. That's Hebrews 5, verse 8. Yet in fact, Matthew record, Matthew's record tells us that right at that time, the Lord Jesus had taken with him Peter, who wrote this, and the two sons of Zebedee, and began to be very sorrowful and very heavy. What does the Lord say? You're going to be in heaviness. Then saith he unto them, My soul is exceeding sorrowful, even unto death. Oh yes, God knows our infirmities. Likewise, also the Spirit helpeth our infirmities. For we know not what we should pray for as we ought, but the Spirit itself maketh intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. Romans 8, verse 26. So the Lord, through Peter, softened the edge of this statement. He could have said, yeah, trials are necessary. But he softened it just a little bit to show us his heart for us. Because the Lord has angst in his heart when we go through trials. Can you believe that? The Lord grieves for us when we go through trials, and yet he puts us through it. Why? It is much like a father and mother who are in angst to see their child be wounded by a fall from their bike as they're learning to ride. 
or weep about some mishap or struggle at some new challenge or fail at something, yet they know it is what is necessary for their growth and for their function. This condition, if need be, is an assumed fulfilled condition, basically saying, if need be, it is needed. It is needed. Our trials are necessary for us. They are necessary for our growth. They are necessary for God's purposes in us, for us in his kingdom and in his church. Herein is another reason to rejoice even during our tribulation. This is necessary for me. It is needed in God's plan for me and with me. I call your attention to one of my very favorite passages in all of scripture, which is 1 Corinthians 15, verse 58, which Brother Riddell has on the sign for us. He says in verse 58, therefore, my beloved brethren, by the way, therefore is the reason I like verse 58, because of the whole chapter. But uh, we have the victory in Christ Jesus. That's why I like it. Verse 57. Therefore, because we have the victory in Christ Jesus. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be you steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as you know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Your labor is not in vain. In other words, it's not worthless. It's not in vain. And what does he say? Your labor. He's not just talking about taking out the trash, although that could be included in it. He's not talking about ushering, although that could be included in it. He's not talking about greeting, although that could be included in it. He's not talking about your work in the nursery. That certainly could be included in it. But he's talking about heavy trials when he says labor. Labor. That is kopos. It means trouble, difficulty, exhaustion, even a striking or beating. In fact, the Septuagint translated this from Jeremiah to indicate the beating of the chest because I'm going through so much difficulty. That's what the word labor means there. Difficulty, exhaustion in the battle, exhaustion in the work. And sometimes we think it's not worth it, I want to give up. No, it's not in vain. It's not in vain. It's not purposeless. It has purpose. It's not in vain. It is not without purpose. It is necessary for you and for you and God's plan. So I can rejoice also in my trials because I realize their necessity. I know they're temporal. I realize that they're needed. I realize their necessity. But number three, I can rejoice in my trials because I am reckoning their value. I am reckoning their value or acknowledging their value. I am seeing their value. So I know that they're necessary, but I want to also see they're valuable. Not just that they're necessary, but that they're valuable. Because he says in verse 7, of 1 Peter 1, that the trial of your faith, being much more precious than of gold that perisheth, though it be tried with fire, might be found unto praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ. Notice he says, much more precious. Precious is an important word, and we'll look at that in just a second. But he says, much more. Trials versus things that are pricey. Trials versus things that are priceless. Trials versus things that are um, inestimable in value are much more valuable. Much more valuable. It's not necessary, it's not enough just to know that our trials are necessary, for then I may be tempted to see them as necessary evils. I just have to go through this. Necessary evils have no redeeming quality but are only tolerated because they're unavoidable. This is a necessary evil. It's just something that we have to deal with because it just is. That's not what our trials are from the Lord's perspective. He says they're valuable. They're more precious, much more precious. This falls short of the spiritual and scriptural logic given to us by our omniscient Father. Notice that in verse 7, the Lord gives us another paradox, that our trials are, our trials are precious. The word precious is timioteron, which basically means honored, of great worth, valued, or even priceless. How difficult it is for us to see our trials in this light. But do you see what the Lord has done here? He has taken you and I from the pit, taken you and I who were irredeemable, and redeemed us. 
He has given us robes of righteousness and made us his heirs. He has taken that which we might see to be less than worthless, namely suffering, and elevated it to an inestimable value. It's amazing what the Lord does. He reverses everything when we're in Christ. Let us see why. Because our suffering is what the Lord calls here the trial of your faith. He says that the trial of your faith being much more precious than of gold that perisheth. That is, the trial of your faith is the dokimion of your faith. That This is the examination certificate of your faith. So the trial of your faith is not the trial that you're going through, necessarily. It is the end result of that trial and how you came through it. The record of how you came through it. The record of you at the end of the trial. That's what the word dokimion indicates there, the trial of your faith. So when your faith comes to test day, and you take the test, and you get the grade back, that's the trial of your faith. It's the test of your faith. It's the grade, if you will, of your faith. This is the examination certificate of your faith. I remember uh, several years ago, you know, you learn all these things in life. I got married, and then we had uh, Eli, and I realized I need to get life insurance. So I went to get life insurance, and I was, you know, a fairly healthy guy. And uh, so I went to uh, get my life insurance. I got all the screening done. They said, you qualify for super plus preferred, you know. So, uh, you know, $18 a month or whatever it was. Good, good, good price, I thought, you know. And uh, so I said, OK, good, sign me up for that. So they sent off my medical records. I got them back. Uh, and uh, nowadays, and even in that time, I, could get it, I got it back in an email. I could log in and see what all the things were. Everything looked great. And then in a few. Uh, weeks I got the call from the insurance company and they said, okay, uh, you, you got preferred and uh, here's the price. And I said, wait a second, I didn't get preferred. They told me I was there for super plus preferred, all these acronyms uh, or uh, adjectives before. And uh, they, said, they said, no, some of your numbers were elevated. And I said, wait a second. I said, uh, I saw the numbers. They're not elevated. I said, which ones? And they said, I think it was cholesterol. It was cholesterol. That's what it was. They said, your cholesterol was a little elevated. And uh, so therefore, you don't qualify for this. So I raised a stink. My wife laughed at me because I raised such a stink. Because I was angry. They quoted this to me. And I looked at the results. They were all good. And so I went back and I looked at the cholesterol. And so they, have, they had it like on a meter, you know, green, and then yellow, and then red. So it was still in the green but it was at the high end of the green. So therefore, they decided that that was means enough for them to raise the price $3 a month or whatever it was, and I was not okay with that. So I raised a stink, and, and uh, I don't know if I was nice or not, but uh, I did raise a stink. And so finally they said, listen, if it means that much to you, they didn't say that, but basically they said that, you can go, come back in a few weeks and get, re, get your blood redrawn and tested and see how it is. I said, very good, I'll do that. And so I waited a few weeks. And in those few weeks, I stopped eating ice cream at night. <laughs> and uh, I ran a couple times, you know. And I, sure enough, got that number right down and, and uh, got, got, the, got the right number. Uh, my point in, all of, in telling you that kind of humorous thing is I had the results of that. And the results showed what I had done. And they showed what I was. That's the trial of your faith. It's the showing of what you are. It is the proof of what is going on, what has gone on in your life. It is the proving of our faith. This happens in all of our lives. We had, all of us went to school in some form or another. We had some kind of testing, some kind of examination. We have jobs. So you have reviews, I'm sure, quarterly, yearly reviews or whatever, what have you, these different things show us what we are, or they purport to show us what we are. They're proving. It's the proving of our faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. It's the genuineness or the quality of being unalloyed. Brother Riddell would know about this, having worked over there at the, uh, what would you call that place? Foundry, Foundry that's right. And so they, he understands what an alloy is. An alloyed metal is two metals, at least, that are mixed together. And so they're not pure, purely one metal. Sometimes that makes them stronger. But when it comes to precious metals, you want that metal to be pure, purely that metal. It's gold in this passage. We want it to be pure. We don't want it to be alloyed. And that's what he talks about when he speaks of the trial of your faith. 
That word trial, the kimion, has the idea of being unalloyed. When it comes to our faith in the Lord, it cannot be mixed or combined, as is the general idea of the word alloyed. It must be totally pure. And the Lord is using the trials in our life to certify or have our faith in him proven. So this new trial is an opportunity for me to certify to the Lord himself, which we'll see in another week, next week, or whenever we get to the next verses, but also for me to certify to my very own self that I do indeed have complete and pure trust in the Lord. This trial is an opportunity for me to demonstrate trust in the Lord for the Lord's sake, so to speak, and for my own sake, and for everybody else's sake. My going through trial with faith in the Lord is a testament to myself that I believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. It is a proof to myself that I am one of his children as I continue to honor him, even in light of suffering. Consider the martyrs when they went to the stake or they were drowned in the river as they were given their final chance to denounce their salvation of the Lord Jesus, Jesus Christ by grace through faith. No, they said, I will not recant. And the flames were lit at their feet by a Roman Catholic bishop. Or think of the great Colosseum of, Colosseum of Rome, where I've been. And I've stood in the stands and looked out over the arena, complete with movable floors and platforms. There they were told to show reverence to the false gods of Rome. And when they refused, they were set in the arena and the, and the lions released on them, tearing them to pieces for the public entertainment of crowds standing where I stood. Not one could question their faith. It was certified. Stamped. No, faith. If they can, to that extent, in that, why not I in this? Notice the Lord says that gold perisheth. Now, physically speaking, that isn't necessarily true. Gold doesn't just perish. Uh, it does get spent, so it perishes that way. Uh, we die, so it perishes that way. Uh, its value fluctuates, so it perishes that way. But the element itself doesn't just disappear. It doesn't perish that way. It's not like some other metals that rust and rot away. It's an enduring metal. But the truth is that once the Lord makes an end of things on this earth, and he will, gold, as we have had it here, with all else that is in this world, will not be found. Notice what he says. That the trial of your faith, being much more precious than of gold that perisheth, though it be tried with fire, might be found unto praise and honor and glory. Gold will not be found at the appearing of Jesus Christ when he's in this context. Faith, though, pure faith will be. Gold will not be found, but faith will be. And all these things, the world will have passed away. But if we are found to have pure faith, faith in the Lord unto death, as did the Lord Jesus, then we shall endure. Remember 1 John, he talks about all the things that are going to pass away. But he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. All of these things in the world are going to pass away. But he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. I can rejoice in my trials because I recognize their value. They are more precious than gold. More precious than gold. Not only do I recognize their value, but I need to recognize their virtue. I can rejoice in my trial because I recognize their virtue. In other words, how good they are. Not just how valuable they are, but how good they are. Their virtue. Notice the next phrase. He says, though it be tried with fire. Though it be tried with fire. Here the Lord is speaking again of the gold. So we're not out of the value spectrum, but we're talking about the goodness of it, the virtue of our trials. He's speaking again of the gold, but not of its perishing. Here he's speaking of its purifying. And he uses a similar word, but different. In the, in the first word, trial of your faith in verse 7, or right at the beginning of the verse, that's dekimion. But here, when he says, though it be tried, so trial and tried are words that are close to one another. Trial is dekimion. Here it is dokamazo. In the first, the Lord is emphasizing the grade or the diploma, what is seen at the end. But in the second, he is emphasizing the administering of the test, the going through of the test. And this is what the Lord does in each one of our lives. He smelts us down. The heat must be applied. The fire. And I was doing some reading on, on uh, the purifying of metal, the refining of, of a gold specifically. And I saw how step after step after step after step has to happen in order to make gold pure. 
a, a burn here, a melt here, an additive of this, and then a removal of that, and then another uh, firing, and then a removal of that kind of metal, and then another and a removal, and then another and a removal, and it takes repetition and the heat being applied over and over, over again until the metal can be purified. Any other substances must be taken out of the gold. Conversely, when it seems like there's absolutely no gold left in a greater substrate, sift through it again, melt that again, and still more gold may arrive from it. We should remember that in the ore of our lives, we begin with much more base metals than precious metals. And there's a whole lot that has to be removed from us. Those who melt ore, or I should say smelt ore, to find and refine pure gold do so at amazingly small ratios. A successful rate of one man said that from 10 or 12 pounds of slag, he can, and I saw pictures of it, 10 or 12 pounds of slag that he fired, he received as much gold as he could be picked up with tweezers. A little tiny bead of gold from all of that dross that had to be removed. So much must be weeded out of our lives. So many things that taint our faith. And I'm talking about things that are wrong with us from a spiritual perspective. What heat must be applied to deal with these imperfections? The Lord knows. These are the manifold temptations. And what imperfections are they? Pride, perhaps, or a rebel spirit? Selfishness, maybe? A lust-led walk? Immorality? anger, faithlessness or unbelief, many other things. All these and all that there could be, the Lord uses trials to administer and test after test to us until one day at the appearing of Jesus Christ, we will have the final meeting with our instructor, the final meeting with our instructor. So I rejoice that in that day, because of the suffering which I here undergo, that I'll be able to be found not by surprise and not unprepared. Notice that word here. He says, though it be tried with fire, it might be found unto praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ. That is to be searched out. I'll be found. Uh, we're going to stand before the judgment seat of Christ, says God's children, and the Lord is going to have a reckoning of our lives and our service for him. And we're going to see what the result is. Are the things that need to be pulled out of my life pulled out? I want to be found under praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ. That's the purpose of trials in our life. That's the virtue of them. That which, that's what makes them good, and that's, what's make, what's, that's what makes your faith good, pure, the trial of your faith. I want to have a gold standard st certificate at my appearing. I don't want to have, well, it's so pure, but not pure. I want to be completely pure before the Lord. Everything that the Lord is teaching me, I want to learn. And so, Lord, if you bring a trial into my life, help me, Lord, to have these perspectives of it so that I can rejoice while I'm going through them. Might be found unto praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ. Praise. This is the commendation of God. The language of God's commendation. God praises our pure faith in him. God praises that. Uh, that's hard for me to wrap my mind around, but God praises that. What, is he, what, is, uh, what does Paul say that he wants to hear? Well done, thou good and faithful servant, right? Well done. Uh, that's what we want to hear, well done. Honor, this is the value and esteem of God. John chapter 12, verse 26, the Lord Jesus said, If any man serve me, let him follow me. And where I am, there shall also my servant be. If any man serve me, him will my father honor. God will give us honor, again, because of our relationship with Jesus Christ. Praise and honor, and then number three, glory. This is the splendor of our presentation with Christ. And in Christ, his glory will be revealed in us. Turn over to Philippians 3. Verse 20, because he says, for our conversation is in heaven, from whence also we look for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall change our vile body, that it might be fashioned like unto his glorious body. This is glorious, according to the working whereby he is able even to subdue all things to himself. 
And then Romans chapter 8, verse 18. A verse we, uh, actually we want to be in verse 17. Begin there. But we, re we mentioned this earlier. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God, join heirs with Christ. If so, be that we suffer with him, that we may be also glorified together. For I reckon the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory that shall be revealed in us. This is the splendor of our presentation with Christ. His glory revealed in us at this time. I do believe this. I believe that there are degrees of these things being worked out in our lives. And as we come through the, the, uh, the uh, book of 1 Peter and get into, even in 2 Peter, I'll bring those points out. Uh, but if we don't serve the Lord in the way that he wants us to, we are going to suffer loss. But if we honor the Lord in the way that he instructs us to, and if we demonstrate faith in him, we're going to receive rewards. That's God's principle in 1 Corinthians chapter 3. I am rejoicing in the heaviness of trials, number one, because I'm remembering their temporality. Number two, because I realize their necessity. Number three, because I, reckon, I am reckoning their value. And number four, because I am recognizing their virtue. And if we have these perspectives of our suffering in our mind, that they are temporal, that they're needed, that they're valuable, and that they're virtuous, if we have those perspectives of our trials, it doesn't take away the heaviness of the trial, but it enables us to rejoice in the trial. Amen. And that's what God, where God wants us to be. Psalm 119, verses 71 and 72. It is good for me that I have been afflicted, said the psalmist. It is good for me that I have been afflicted, that I might learn thy statutes. The law of thy mouth is better unto me than thousands of gold and silver. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for how you work your will in our lives. And I thank you for how you bring trials and suffering into our lives to teach us things. And, how, and you bring these things also in our lives to use us in the lives of others. And so I pray, Lord, that you'd continue to work these things out in us. You know, we don't want to go through suffering. We don't desire suffering. We pray to remove ourselves from suffering. But if need be, when you bring them into our lives, we know that they're necessary from you. So Lord, I pray that you'd help us to learn the lessons. I pray that you'd help us to come forth as gold Help us, when we are tried, to come forth as gold, as Job stated, Lord. We thank you for your word, and I thank you for the, the ability that we have to rejoice, even though, if need be, for a season, we're in heaviness through manifold temptations. I pray that you'd encourage each heart here this morning with these words. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.